Welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on current trends and timeless advice for surviving in the aesthetics industry. Whether you're an injector, practice owner, sales rep, or marketer, it's time to set the record straight. Each week, we cut through the chaos and showcase diverse perspectives and winning ideas from the best minds in the industry. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Hall, Chief Growth Officer at Aesthetic Record. Now, let's get started on this week's episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of For the Record. We are on episode seven of season two, and today we have a dear friend, a person who I respect and just think is magnificent on our show today, Dr. David Sadat, who is in Beverly Hills. He owns um, three practices. He is a board certified facial plastic surgeon, otolaryngologist, and sleep medicine doctor, so he's got a lot going on. He's also training across the country with a big focus on anatomy right now. He has been training with Sculptra since I think the day they launched Sculptra. He is a genius when it comes to training, but also all of his surgical procedures, injectable procedures, just a fascinating story about his whole life as well. And so we are honored and blessed today to have with us Dr. Sadat. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Tiffany. That was a beautiful uh, introduction. I, I should, can you record that and send that to me so I can use that in the future? That was, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you're making me blush actually about that. but. Um, I, I want to thank you for having me on your show. I'm, I'm so proud of what you've done all, all, you know, all this couple of seasons getting to this level. And, and uh, this podcast is absolutely uh, tremendous for everyone in the industry. So I want to thank you for having this. Well, we're glad to have you today because I think your story is fascinating. I met you, gosh, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. Melinda Bentz from Galderma introduced us. She just raved about you forever. And I said, I got to meet this guy. I came to your practice and met you and a few of your staff. And I understood immediately why she was just so enamored with you. I think, you know, in our industry, people often become become a big deal, as you know. They become, you know, not egotistical, but a big deal. They read their own press, the whole kind of thing. You know how people do. And you're just not like that at all. I think you've always been so humble and so eager to help and be part of what we're doing here at Aesthetic Record, at, even at Galderma back then when I was there. And I just feel like your, your passion for this industry is really from a place of a good-hearted nature about training and developing other people and you know, obviously a byproduct is to make money and be successful and to have all the accolades, but um, I think you have a different spin on things. I want to really dive in today on who you are and what makes you tick, but also all the things that you're doing, because my goodness, guys, he's doing a lot of stuff right now, so he's a busy, busy dude. But I want to start from the beginning with you. I read last night somewhere that you, I didn't know this, that you came from Iran as like a kid, like a teenager, and moved to Beverly Hills with, I believe, an uncle or a family member and started high school and then voila here you are so i want to go back to like that moment of your life of what gave you the cojones to decide to do that i don't know i'm wow you found out okay i guess <laughs> now that you found out anything about anybody so i uh you're right i i uh i was in a weird situation back in the day there was a war that we had between iran and iraq and i was uh 16 and you had to uh, sign up for military at that point and join. And you know, I'm I'm against wars and I, against any conflicts. I, I don't like any of those. I'm I like to you know we're all good and nice people in the world, and I think we should all get along. So I I never believed in that. And my parents decided that there's no point for you to join the military. Just get out of here. And basically, I got out, came here. I had an uncle here, um, and uh, I always wanted to go into education. And, and medicine was kind of nice to go and so I went to believe it or not Beverly Hills High School I found myself really awkward being there because I didn't belong I, I didn't know anybody and it was a tough crowd to to kick in and and then you know luckily I only had to spend one year in high school and then went to college and I just found myself to be accelerating in 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 education and it, it was it was really nice I really enjoyed it and being in a new country I had tremendous support from everybody and um, you know, everybody supported me uh, from from school to friends to families, new friends that I made, and it, it just worked out really nicely. It was it was beautiful for me to go from, you know, someone that was in some other country with no no real uh, future because of what was going on, and coming here and having tremendous uh, opportunity. You know, they say it's this this place is land of opportunity. It's true. It is land of opportunity, and that just worked out really well for me. And I just I just enjoyed the ride and just went through, you know, and, and it became a total nerd. As you said, I went from college to med school. Then I did uh, otolaryngology, 
because I was always obsessed with noses. I don't know why. There's something about noses, and people make fun of me when I say that, but I was just obsessed with noses. And I remember when I was younger, you know, people would make fun of me, and they would stick their finger in their nose and go, oh, here you go, nose for you. So I was always obsessed with noses. So I went into photolaryngology because you deal with noses. And then soon after that, I just, you know, kept going. And, you know, back in the day, it was really hot to do um, cosmetic stuff. I don't know if you remember, there was a lot of um, you know, extreme makeover. And, and all of a sudden, you know, this, this, this field of aesthetic medicine that was for elite and rich people and wealthy people went from there to people that had, I don't want to sound condescending, but no money and they, they couldn't afford it, but they would come and have all these shows that were on extreme makeover. It became really exciting. So I'm like, okay, I, need, I should do facial plastic surgery. And, and I got lucky, the people that I worked with, they were absolutely amazing. My mentors were great. I did that and I, I got on a couple of those shows uh, it got me really busy, and that's how my story started. So we have an immigrant coming from a foreign country with very little, comes to America, goes to medical school, ends up on TV, <laughs> now owns multiple practices, has a surgery center in one of them, and you're one of the top billed guys in the country right now for training. So I'd say you did a pretty damn good job, Dr. Sadat. Kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, you know, land of opportunity, they say, and... and um, I mean, I don't know who's who's watching, hopefully uh, all kinds of people. But for those young ones, honestly, this is, you know, you you got to take advantage of, of this, you know, because you can do anything. You can do anything you want and you just have to be very passionate. Um, ambition matters, very passionate and just love what you do. And, and you can go anywhere you want with it. So I got lucky throughout the whole thing. And I'm, I'm blessed for, for getting to this level. And you said I'm doing a lot of training and education. And you know, for some reason, I feel like I need to give back. And you, I know, you know, you were you were always in the education side of, of, of the field. And I know, you know, that those of us who enjoy education, it's just it's just rewarding and, and part of us giving back. And I think I'm, I've got to my second part of my life. You know, I guess once you pass 50, you, you're now in your second stage. So I, I, I got to a stage where I'm like, OK, you know, I. I enjoyed the first half. Now I need to give back. And for some reason, that's extremely rewarding to me. Well, I'm shocked that you're over 50, by the way. Let's just put that out there. <laughs> that's surprising. Um, I had no idea. Although we all look a lot better than we should because of all of our procedures. But, you know, I think you say luck. I, I disagree with you. I think, you know, of course, luck plays a role in it. Right time, right place. Um, but I think a big part of this is resilience. You know, I think looking at people like you in medicine, period, nurses, whomever, like you have to be so resilient in this industry because it's so fast, it's so much coming at you, so much chaos every day that if you don't have that like sort of resilience, thick skin, you can't make it here. I mean, this is like Broadway, right? I feel like medicine, I feel like aesthetics is like Broadway in New York. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere because it is so challenging. And I want to kind of kind of unpack that with you because you mentioned starting with like the extreme makeover time period. I remember those shows. That's how I even probably ended up in aesthetics. It was probably ingrained in my mind from an early age. But how has the industry changed looking at it from your perspective as both a surgeon and an injector? What's different now? Where do you see us like the gaps and the problems that we have in the industry or the or the wonderful things that we have in the industry now compared to, let's say, even 2005, 2010, 15, you know, as you've kind of come along? Well, you know, I. I you're right. Resilience is really key and uh, makes a big difference. And I think at the end of the day, the way I think about it is that you got to be nice. You got to be humble. You got to treat people well and uh, just have a passion and just go for it. And yeah, you know, you, you I kind of tell my kids that you, you got to have a, like a tunnel vision, you know, just if you think about that you want to be a doctor, all you have to think about being a doctor, being a doctor, being a doctor, and all these distractions, you just get rid of them and you just continue in that path. And uh, and just be nice about it and you, you get there. You just have to ha be very focused. I think that, that what, so resilience, it translates into being super focused. Um, the, the industry has changed tremendously. We had a lot of ups and downs and I don't want to make this a historical thing, but you know, the extreme makeover days made aesthetic medicine really popular. And then, you know, for those of you who are younger and, and listening, you know, then we had the, 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 um, the depression area where the, the, you know, the real estate market and the loan market crashed. And then all of a sudden, all the, you know, discretionary money went away. And, and you know, we, we had a little bit of a depression in aesthetic medicine. And 
that's when I got into, believe it or not, I got into sleep medicine because one of the robotic uh, um, companies came to me and said, you know, uh, we have a robot. We want, you know, we're looking for people to use it and we can use it in head and neck area. And this is fantastic for sleep apnea surgery. And you can do that. And, you know, me being a nerd, I'm like, okay, you know, forget it. I'll just go into a robotic thing. So I started playing with robots and, and, and I really enjoyed it, you know, doing that. So then uh, there was an opportunity for, for me become to sleep, uh, become a sleep medicine certified, doing a lot of sleep apnea surgery, which goes again with no surgery, airway surgery. So that was my next stage of being a nerd, becoming a third, you know, the third board certification, which I don't know why I did it, but I really enjoy doing it. So I did that. Then at some point, aesthetic medicine got better, economy got better. And then what happened? COVID. COVID came and, you know, let's not be negative. You know, COVID was great for, for us. Fantastic. I mean, I know we, you know, there's a lot of unfortunate situations, people getting sick and everything. But when it comes to aesthetic medicine and surgical uh, cosmetic surgery, COVID was the best thing that happened. Huge amount of um, improvement in in all the injectables. All of a sudden, all the companies have all these new inject injectables coming out. There's a lot of new FDA guidelines. Almost the entire face is on label now for injection. And then, unfortunately, there was so much injectables done, so much, so many fillers done. We started having the overfill patients, which basically push the surgical market into saying, okay, you know what? Too much filling you don't need filling, you need surgery. So all of a sudden my surgical practice went crazy because we had all these like, you know, filler fatigue patients that were overfilled saying that I don't want to, I don't want to look overfilled. I need surgery. So facelifting and facial rejuvenation went sky high. And personally for me, I had, you know, unfortunately we had a close down for three months uh, in Beverly Hills. There was a moment memorandarium that you cannot do any elective surgery. Some of, some, some of the doctors didn't listen and got fined for it. So we were all scared, closed down the office, lost all my staff except for one. And this one staff was amazing. She said, you know, you, you do tremendous amount of training because I've always done private training in my office. I enjoyed it. And she goes, you know, you need to take this to the next level. So we started recording a lot of training uh, online virtually because everything became virtually. So that was another thing that COVID did you know, a lot of this education became virtual. Um, you know, I, I was listening, you know, not, not to sidetrack, but I was listening to a, a, a virtual meeting that was supposed to be in Turkey, but it couldn't happen. The new way of doing rhinoplasty, it's become really popular now called preservation rhinoplasty. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Turkey has, for some reason, has become the mecca of, of this. So I wanted to travel there, but if you think about it, for me to travel there, I have to take a week or two off. It would probably cost me twenty, thirty thousand dollars to go there and and be uh, in this course. Well, my friend and I decided to do it in our in our uh, living room on a big screen TV. It cost us two hundred and fifty bucks, and we ordered breakfast and lunch and dinner, and we just watched the whole thing on 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 TV. So things have changed because of COVID, and, and this virtual thing has has allowed us to do a lot of learning and a lot of teaching both. So three months we were closed, we recorded tons of material for teaching. And then that just all of a sudden got a lot of attention nationally um, and just got better and better. It, I think a lot of the nurses that were in, in, in the industry doing COVID uh, uh, hospital work got tired of it. And uh, they said, well, you know what? I'm gonna go and do injectables because my friends are all asking, can I do Botox? Can I do this and that? And, and I can do it. So we've had this tremendous push of, I know this term is bad. We talked about this, you and I talked about this, you know, calling the mid-levels, which, which I hate that term because one of my nurses saying, what do you mean the mid-level? I'm not a high level, I'm a mid-level. So I think it's kind of offending to them. So all these like beautiful aesthetic providers that uh, are now in into this came into the field and they're hungry, hungry for knowledge. And uh, so, I found myself in a place where my surgical practice picked up big time because of overfilled patients. My, uh, you know, I lost all of my, my staff members. 
So then I had to rehire a bunch of staff members. And for some reason, all of them that I hired are more education and, and virtual training oriented, which, we, which works really well. And, uh, and then, you know, we have all these uh, new injectors uh, in the industry that are hungry to learn. And uh, as you and I know, there's, you know, that when you have all the new injectors come in, there's, there's more and more complications. So for some reason in my neighbor locally, this also affected me where I was getting some of the complications of, of, of injectables, unfortunately. And I don't want to make this negative, but we had a bunch of VOs here, uh, vascular occlusions, and, and somehow they would send them to me to handle. So I, you know, I think as, as educators and as, as, you know, I'm, I'm by no means any leader, but leaders in the field, it is our obligation to make sure that all these new people coming into the field of aesthetic are well trained. Otherwise, it would affect humanity. You know, we, we, we need to protect the public. And the way we protect the public is that the ones that have a little bit more experience and have been around like me, it's my obligation to make sure that the new ones are doing really well and are, are, are uh, very well trained. And uh, you know, there's so many different uh, aspects of making someone a safe uh, injector, and we're talking about injectors for now, but safe injector or safe surgeons. And there's so many different aspects, the techniques and how to hold the syringe and, you know, understanding rheology and this and that. But I think one of the main things is understanding anatomy. And uh, I found myself all of a sudden that, you know, as a surgeon, I've had a lot of anatomical experience, cadaver dissection. And, you know, every time we do any kind of educations, we have that. But I realized that a lot of nurses, PAs, nurse practitioners, even non-core non doctors have never taken an anatomy course. And I think that has, that has tremendous effect on the field. Uh, it's because, you know, if you really face it, uh, again, I'm focusing on injection, but if you really face it, you take a needle, you stick it underneath the skin, you have no idea where you are. All you can see is the needle going through the skin. So if you don't know what's under the skin, if you don't, if you can't imagine where you are, then uh, you're lost. It, it's like trying for, for me to tell you, Tiffany, you know, go, here's $10 million, go deposit it in Bank of America, here's a car, and so you have the car, which is, you have the $10 million, which is the filler, Bank of America is under your eyes, you know where it is, but you have no idea how to get there because you don't have a GPS. You don't know the roads, you don't know the stop signs, you don't know the, the, the red lights. So anatomy, and I think the cadaver anatomy allows you to learn the streets so you can get to the bank and deposit the money. That's the way I think about it. And so somehow, you know, I, I got into that and, and I'm really enjoying it actually. Uh You've made like a million great points there that I'm going to try to unpack all of it for us right now. But <laughs> first of all, that analogy about the bank is genius. I don't know, Dr. Sadat, if you know me, but I love to use metaphors. My team would tell you that. I love metaphors for everything. I think people understand them when you give them real tangible stories. So I think the bank analogy is perfect because that's what I think about all the time with anatomy. And obviously, I'm not a doctor. I'll put that out here right now, guys. You all know I'm not an MD, nor a nurse, nor a PA, or anything like that. But I have spent a lot of my life studying anatomy and filler and rheology, all the things that you mentioned. And I've been immersed in it for thousands of hours of CMEs. Like I have done thousands of hours. And it's still, there are so many things that even me listening to all of it, I don't know the answers. That when you go to a cadaver lab and you touch it and it's tactile for you and you can feel it and you can see it and you can like get depth perception of where things are and the structures, it's just a much different experience than hearing it. You know, I agree with you, virtual learning. I'm a big proponent of that because it's much, you know, much cheaper. I'll use the word cheaper for the person watching to not have to fly and go and do, which, you know, as a person with a live conference, I shouldn't say that on a podcast, but it is a lot cheaper. But at the same time, there is something about, you know, in a cadaver lab, the tactile nature of it that you just can't replace. I have been in discussions for multiple days um, at this point as of today about this, about, you know, can you use anatomy tools versus cadaver labs? The answer for me is no, you have to go to a cadaver lab. You just have to go do it. You've got to get your hands on it. So I think what, you know, we've seen in the last, I don't know, maybe three years that cadavers are now sexy. Anatomy is now sexy again. It's like the thing to do which is great for the industry because, you know, five years ago, it was, it was extraordinarily hard to find a lab. They were incredibly expensive. You couldn't find them. They were at medical schools only. They weren't traveling around. You know, Jonathan Sykes, a few guys were doing them here and there, but not like it is now where 
you can go get great education for an affordable price, you know, for an all-day class, where five, ten years ago, that was like not even not even an option, much less could you even go do it. it just, you couldn't even get into one. So I think what you're doing, what, you know, you and some others are doing, we'll talk about that in a little bit, too, about what all the things that, you know, you have coming up, but it's a huge benefit for the industry. And I do think what you mentioned about the adverse event issues, I look at, Dr. Nassif, uh, that whole group with botched, right? When botched came out, everyone's like, oh, gosh, if you get any kind of surgery, you're going to be disfigured forever. It's that, that idea that one drop brow in a market is a whole market's drop brow, right? We all have to suffer together for adverse events or problems. If you hear about a VO online, then everyone gets a VO. It's just, it becomes this, like, permeating problem that we have to solve one injector at a time. And I think you're right about the amount of new people coming in. The, the bedside burnout is so high right now. Um, which I can completely understand with COVID. And people are hungry to get something that they enjoy, that they're passionate about again, that they love. And this this industry, as you and I both know, is a passion project. <laughs> it has to be every day for some of the things we all put up with. But um, to that point, thinking about you as you know a surgeon as well. So how are you fitting in? I know you're training on injectables a lot. How are you fitting in the surgical side of your business? Because at your core, you, know, you are a surgeon. You're not an injector. You're both. But I mean, your core you know, training for all those gazillions of years is in surgery. So when do you fit in a facelift and then turn around the next day and go do a training? How does your schedule even work to accommodate all that? I, you know, I can't believe you touched on the biggest, the, my biggest problem right now in, in, <laughs> in my practice, because you're right, it's very, very difficult to do training, surgery, and injectables. And, um, and so you know, going back to kind of what we talked about. So I, let me tell you a little bit about my background when it comes to cadaver, of course, and, and surgery, because that, that, that made a difference for me. So I was an immigrant and came to this country. And unfortunately, my parents were not here, so I didn't have money. And, you know, when I was in med school and residency, the way I made money was I, I was a TA for cadaver anatomy. That's what I did. That was my, that was the way I made money. And also I delivered babies because I was at USC County Hospital and we had way too many babies being born. They didn't have enough residents and mid, uh, midwives. So they would pay medical students. Like I was getting $100 a night, I never forget, to stay up all night and deliver. And they were coming, these women were coming from everywhere. And so we delivered like 10, 15 babies a night. So it was kind of fun. So that's how I made money, cadaver anatomy, TA, and, and delivering babies. And then, you know, obviously as a surgical uh, uh, residency and surgical practice, you keep practicing anatomy. Then, um, you know, I remember when, when I was in my fellowship, my, my mentor said, you know, you should start doing injectables. We were doing a lot of fat transfer back in the day, which, which is amazing. But collagen was in, and then shortly after Restylane, the first filler came into the market. And Believe it or not, he, I asked him, you know, how do you inject? It's, like, it's really simple. You just go in the nasal labial fold, don't go too deep, don't go too superficial and inject it. And you and I know today that that is the worst thing you can do. That was, you know, my mentor was absolutely amazing, but I think that one, one thing that he told me to this day is, is I can't believe that we didn't have a lot of people going blind and having VOs because that, that was the training. So my, the point that I'm trying to make is that as a surgeon, we have no idea what filler anatomy is. So that's that's point number one. You think that you go to a plastic surgeon and because they know anatomy, they know how to inject. That is not true. Recently, again, I don't want to talk negative, but recently somebody went to a an eye doctor, eye specialist, thinking that if they go to an eye specialist and get an under eye injection, it would be safer. And she had a VO and it would it became, you know, all over the internet and everything. So the point I'm trying to make, just because we're surgeons, that doesn't mean that we're good injectors. That's number one. So I realized that, and because my mentor was a fat transfer uh, guru, uh, and so I, I knew that volume is as important as lifting. And for, you know, I and, and you know the industry is kind of weird, you know, surgeons all stick together and say, no, 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 everything is surgery, you know, injectables are BS, don't do that. And then injectors say, no, 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 you, you know, these surgeons want to make money and stuff like that. I'm right in the middle because I realized that half of the problem is lifting. The other half is volumization. And, the, uh, and, and to make it even a little bit more 
elaborate. The early part of your life, you need injectables, and then there's a point where you cross, and injectables don't work, and, and you need surgery. So I, 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 I'd like to be able to be an expert in the full spectrum. So I realized little by little that the anatomy that I knew was not really the right anatomy. It was just <clears throat> surgical anatomy. So, and every an anatomical training that I went for fillers, I realized that it was given by a plastic surgeon, which is got great, it should be, uh, because we, we know the anatomy a little bit better. But, you know, they talked about surgery, they never, they were never able to apply the anatomy to fillers and injectables. So somehow, because I, I have a passion for volumization, you know, starting with sculpture, as you know, and, and then, you know, doing a lot of fat transfer. So volume was, was a big deal. Filling was a big deal for me always. So I was able to create courses little by little by little as faculty of different cadaver courses to be able to teach how to do, how to apply the anatomy in a cadaver to actual injectables. And so because of that, and, and as you said, after COVID and being so hungry and all these new people coming into to feel for education, I now have my own cadaver courses because, you know, I figured I, I, I do it different than other people. And I, it got to a point that I got frustrated with the courses not being actually done for applied filler injection. They were just being surgical anatomy. So for that reason, I have my courses. But <clears throat> having said that, going back to the point you were making, so I'm doing all of that. It's really busy. I my surgical practice has picked up because, as I said, the spectrum is, is very important for me. And uh, it was really beautiful when COVID happened and I closed down the office. A lot of the med spas were closed also. Medical offices opened before the med spas. So all of a sudden, because of my exposure to, you know, the, the aesthetic providers, a bunch of them called me and said, hey, can, can we come and work in your office? And, uh, you know, I was a surgeon. I wasn't really connected with them. And so I, I started saying, sure, why not come over here, come over here. So now I have five uh, nurses, nurse practitioner and a PA that work for me. Um, they're absolutely fabulous. Every single one of them are great. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, one of the med spas that closed, the owner came to me and said, you know, you know, I'm done with this. I want to move to East Coast, Rhode Island, I think. And I just want to get rid of my med spa. So I, I bought it from her because, you know, the, 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 that's the way it was during the beginning of COVID. So I realized that, you know, maybe I have an opportunity here where I can focus on my surgery, focus on my education, and honestly give the injectables to these aesthetic providers. They're, they're, sometimes they're better at it, you know, because they're doing it day in, day out, you know, 10, 15, 20 times a day versus, versus me trying to fit it in between my surgeries and between my, my education and my travels. And, you know, and, and they come and wait for me. It becomes annoying for them. You know, it, 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 just, it just happens that they're, they become better at it. And so that's how I'm trying to kind of, and I, as, as you said, you know, what, what the challenge right now is, is what exactly you point out. And the challenge is that I got to do my surgeries. I got to do my education and, and, and the fun stuff. So I got to give up something and not that I'm giving it up. I'm just having all these other aesthetic providers working with me. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Each one of them has a, and I'm learning from them as they're learning from me. Each one of them has something that they bring to the table. All of a sudden, you know, one of them does this. I'm like, hmm, you know, I've never seen that. And then, you know, we, we all get together. We have co-trainings together and we learn from each other. So I think we have, because of this, we have all gotten much, much better uh, in the past two, three years. So that's how I'm trying to kind of keep my surgical practice alive and busy while the, the injectables are being done by my aesthetic providers. Well, I know that you're on Instagram. You listen to Instagram. Or you see Instagram stories. We had this big thing. Um, Julie Bass Kaplan pointed out a few doctors were hating on her because she wasn't a doctor or something. It was ridiculous, whatever it was. And, you know, when we find doctors in the industry who love nurses and who love PAs, we, like, cling on to them because it's it's sometimes hard to find, right? People, they get in this whole, like, to, to use the word, you use mid-level. You know, we've talked about that word. such a dirty word now. Or extender is a bad word. But I think what you said, we talk a lot here in this podcast about business ownership and how to run a great business. From a business perspective, what you said is absolutely paramount. 
only you can do surgery, right? You're the only surgeon that works for you. Only you can be in the surgical suite doing a facelift, doing a nose, you know, a rhinoplasty, only you. But injectables can be done by somebody else every day who's also very talented and very skilled and very good at it. It's just a good business decision. Forget, you know, forget the ego, forget the narcissism, forget all the things that we talked about in the industry. As a business owner, for you to stay profitable, you have to do the things that only you can do, which is, in your case, surgery. And they can do what they can do, which is injectables. I think, you know, it's a, if nothing else, if they are safe and effective and have great outcomes, it's just a business. It's a business no-brainer for me to say, you go, you go do what you do, I'll go do what I do. And together we're, we become better at both the things because we're able to actually focus on our craft and not be going back and forth. And to your point, back and forth, the patient's waiting for six months to see you and all the chaos that ensues. But with, to that point, though, so you're, you know, you're bouncing around personally between three practices, seeing patients plus the med spa. You have a certified, you know, OR suite, which I know is a very hard thing. If you guys have never done that whole certification process, it's a freaking nightmare. It's very, very involved. From a business perspective, how do you run your business? Do you have, you know, um, operations manager, CFO, C? Like, how do you keep the business going while you're practicing your craft in all these different places? Oh, great question. And I think that's that's probably the biggest challenge. And you you need good staff. You really good need good staff. And uh, so uh, when this COVID thing happened and I switched to this model where I do surgery, I have uh, my nurses and PAs and nurse practitioners doing injectables. Um, I have a surgery center, as you say, which is a pain in my butt, but you know, I think it's critical to have it. Then I have all these younger surgeons that uh, can get us. So in Beverly Hills, you cannot open a new surgery center for some odd reason. The city doesn't allow. They, they don't make money. That you know, tax tax dollars come from retail stores. Surgery centers don't make money for the city, so they don't want anymore. And there's millions of them in there. So, you know, all these young surgeons coming out, they don't have a place to operate. So they're all coming. You know, I have a handful of them that come to my my surgery center and talking about training with surgeons. You know, we that's another beautiful aspect of my practice where I have all these new guys coming into the surgery center and we learn from each other. You know, I've obviously. I'm a little bit more experienced than them, so they're all training with me per se. But at the same time, they all came from different backgrounds, so I'm learning a few things from them too. You know, the best part of being a teacher is that you learn from your students, and and I'm sure you, you've been around, so you realize that that that, that is probably the most rewarding part of the being a teacher because you learn every day. You learn something new. You become better. So, uh, you know, I got lucky after this COVID thing that I had to change my entire staff. Back in the day, I was more like okay, patients come in, you know, I have a reputation, they just come in, want to do surgery, we book them for surgery, and that's it. Now, my staff realizes that it's not just that, it's running the surgery center, running the, 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 the nurse practitioners, nurses, and stuff like that. And, and you and I know they're, 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 tough, they're tough to run because, uh, you know, they're, they're all very, you know, they're, they're good, they're professionals, and they want to be respected and you have to create a very beautiful environment for them so they can they can they can get better and 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 improve and and be happy um so that and that and then on top of that educational portion i hired a a full-time staff for my just the training courses and that's that's all he does he just keeps scheduling training communicating with you and with other people just to get things done so more staff um uh, people that understand um, I have a full-time bookkeeper in-house because I, for the life of me, I can't keep track of what happens with the money. As, as you know, as people out there who have businesses, you know, you need reports all the time. And so I have a full-time bookkeeper in my office. You know, every dollar that comes in, every dollar that goes out, he's, he looks at it. And if something doesn't make sense, he keeps bugging me and calling me and emailing me and texting me until he gets the answer. But at, at least I can see the, the picture of what's going on. And, uh, and I have a manager that kind of oversees everything, oversees all the staff, because now you're going from one or two staff members to you know, 10, 15 staff members, then you have to manage them. And um, you know, my, my teacher used to make fun of me all the time and make fun of this situation. It's like, listen, you know, running an office is like, is like a kindergarten. You have to babysit everybody. And I hate to put it that way, but at some points it's true, you know, because everybody has feelings, everybody has, you know, issues at home and you have to manage all of those. And 
as a business owner and someone who does surgery, I won't be able to do all of that if I don't have the right staff. So, you know, I think it all comes down to, to having uh, great staff, great uh, um, policies and procedures in place, uh, number of meetings back to back to back to back, just to make sure that we talk about everything and correct all the mistakes. Um, otherwise, the business won't flow. So that's, I think that for me, that's the solution. And I'm still working on it, believe it or not. I think we're all still working on it. But, you know, being, I think about businesses as like being a landlord. You know, when you're an absentee landlord and the place is falling in, you don't know until you show up to rent it to the next person and realize that the place is gutted, that your tenant has destroyed the bathrooms, broken the, you know, all the things that go wrong. I feel like businesses are much the same. I have many friends who own businesses who are absentee business owners, right? They have a business, they own it, they may show up once a month and say hi, but they're not part of any of it. Someone else is doing all of it. And I think when it comes to medical practice, when there's patient safety, which I know is a big, you know, a huge thing for you, patient safety is at stake, reputations, people's livelihoods, careers, all these things, you got to be part of, you got to be involved, be part of it every day in some way, you know, to your point, meetings, being, you know, part of the discussions, touching base, all these things that happen. And I know it's for you, I'm sure, very hard between training, surgery, injecting. But guys, I mean, I think to your point, Dr. Sadat, you have to just make time for it. Because if you don't, you're going to show up one day and it's not going to be what you think it is. And you're going to be in a world of trouble. So for those people who want to just like buy a med spa and hang out and never, you know, never show up, it doesn't work that way. I think you have to be part of it. Be, you know, set the, the, the ambiance, the environment that you mentioned, make it, you know, you're an adult babysitter. We say that all the time here. Like, we all need an adult babysitter to, like, manage our lives, especially at work because we all bring our own baggage here. So, you know, the ability to do all the emotional gatekeeping that you do as a business owner and your actual job and try to work about, you know, work on profits and revenue and all these things, it's a lot of shit, guys. It's a lot of shit to do. So you have to be, again, resilient is the word I'm using today. But I want to transition into your training more specifically for listeners about where to go to find you, because I think what we talked about with Aesthetic Next, so guys, spoiler alert, Dr. Sadat will be leading our cadaver labs at Aesthetic Next. We're going to have two this year. We're going to have a regular facial anatomy lab focused on injections, and then a second one that's really focused on adverse event management, looking at the things we mentioned, VOs, how to prevent things like this from happening, getting a really good sense of you know what's under the skin. But we discussed this early on, you and I, that I wanted very injection-focused anatomy, what you mentioned. I don't need surgical anatomy here. I need injection-focused anatomy. And I think your course, there's a couple more who are doing this, but your course is so specifically focused on that part of it where a person comes and if they're an injector, they're going to get tremendous value because it's all geared toward what they do every single day. It's not ancillary, tertiary, fluffy anatomy, which is all important, by the way, but it's really focused on what they do all day. So I want to give people an idea of where to find you to get this done because September is a long way away. <laughs> Guys, do not wait till September. Go now. I know that I'm going to see you in LAMCA in a couple of weeks. You're going to be with um, Dr. Keon Karimi and his course at LAMCA in a few weeks. But I know you've got a big event coming up with Leslie Fletcher. Give us some details on that because I feel like that opportunity right there alone is just to see you and Dr. Alexander Rivkin together and Steve Weiner, all three of you in one place is just, my goodness, like a bang for your buck. It's crazy. So tell us about that course and how you kind of ended up with that and give us the details about how to get registered for that class. Very exciting. I have so many courses coming up. And and so please go to my Instagram and there's a link there or go to my website. All the courses are listed there. Uh, so there's so many of them. And if you want to register, that's the way to go. Believe it or not, I met Leslie at your course last year uh, when I was helping with the cadaver course. And she came up to me and said, you know what, if she was, if she was, a, she was listening to me. She says, you know what, the, the, way, the way you talk about how to do anatomy is really interesting. Would you like to do a course in my training center? And as you, you know, and the listeners who are listening, Leslie Fletcher is, became number one training center in the nation. Right? He, she won that, that title. So she is absolutely amazing when it comes to setting this up. I went and visited her place. She's, she's in LA, in Torrance, close to me, and beautiful center. I mean, this is beautifully set up for something, something like what we're doing. And so we had a great talk, and uh, um, she wanted to do a very, very detailed course, and I told her that's the only way we should do it. So it's all day from 8 to 5, not 2 hours, not 60 minutes, 90 minutes. It's all day. And I told Leslie that this that, you know, we're not going to do any surgical stuff. I'd like to do it in a way that every point that we make in this course 
can be applied on Monday morning if the course is on Friday. On Monday morning, when they go back and inject, they can use that little anatomy that I showed them about the forehead complex for their neurotoxin injection, the nasal labial fold for their filler injection. And, and again, it's a filler um, guided anatomical dissection, uh, a filler and, and injectables. And it, the, the way we've set it up is that the cadavers are already dissected. So we're not wasting time dissecting because, you know, face it, a lot, a lot of the, you know, especially the ones that aesthetic providers that are nurses and PAs and they don't need to do dissection. It's unnecessary for them. They just need to know where the needle goes in there. What is that GPS to take him from my office to the bank that we talked about? You know, they need to know the streets and the stop signs. The blood vessels are the stop signs. So, you know, they need to know where to stop and when to make a turn and when to, to make a U-turn and come back. So that's what we're going to focus on. Um, and, and to know, to, so I want to create this imagination in their head that when they put the needle underneath the skin, now they have this engraved in their head that, oh, okay, I just hit this mass, I hit this muscle, now I'm in the prezygomatic pre space, here's the facial artery close to, close to the tip of my, my cannula based on the anatomical understanding that we've had. I want that engraved in their head so when they put the needle underneath the skin on Monday or Tuesday, when they go back, they know exactly where they are. If, you know, so it, they have the GPS in their head. Um, so that's the, that's the course with Leslie. It's all day, a lot of details. We're gonna dissect the entire face, starting from forehead to eyebrow, eyelids, nose, uh, tear trough, mid face, nasal labial fold, upper lip, lower lip, chin, uh, cheeks, lateral jaw, temples, product gland. You know what, how to avoid it. You know how to do how to create a more lateral jaw platysma. It, we even talked about neurotoxins for, for uh, let's say, people that have excessive saliva getting into the submandibular gland, product gland, uh, neurotoxins for pain and TMJ issues. So we're going to dissect out all those muscles and, well, it's already dissected, show how to inject those, mus uh, those muscles. So it's a tremendous course. It's on March, uh, what's, let me see the date, March, March 4th uh, on a Friday. Uh, I think we have a couple more spots left. If you're interested, you know, go through my Instagram or, or website or go through Leslie Fletcher's. Um, you know, I've invited Dr. Ripkin, who's a very, very good friend of mine, and he's a phenomenal injector. He, he, he's got very fantastic techniques on how to be safe. So he's going to be helping uh, in the course as, as a faculty. And I, I have some of my nurses and PAs in my practice that have been doing this with me, being there just to help everybody. So as opposed to one of the courses where you go, there's 100 people sitting there and you just lost. Uh, my course is, is very specific because at every station, I have an expert to make sure that you're navigating through this filler uh, injectable guided anatomy from A to Z so you're not lost and it's efficient. Um, so, so we have Dr. Rifkin who's there and a bunch of my, my uh, help in the office. And then we have Dr. Weiner the next day that's talking about ultrasound anatomy. So I, it's a very, very unique course. Um, and, and I think those of you who are in LA or want to come from outside LA, you know, please sign up for it. Um, and then, as you said, the, the week after we have Dr. Karimi's course, which is fantastic. It's four days. On Sunday, we have the cadaver anatomy that um, I'm running with him. Uh, you know, he's so busy. I told him, you know, why don't you do other stuff? Let, let me do this and I'll do it with you. So, you know, we're good friends and, and he, he really liked that. We've done a few cadaver courses together. And, um, and so now he's like, okay, you do this, I'll do everything else. And, and I'm doing a bunch of other things, sculpture workshop with Shino Bay and, and Natalia. I'm doing a high risk, uh, injectable course, uh, workshop during that. And then, you know, that, that continues and we have a bunch of other things coming. Um, uh, I have, uh, I, I, during the train the trainer, I, I saw a lot of the game trainers in San Francisco area, in the Bay Area, and, and they invited me to come and talk about sculpture. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden we just, they're all at my cadaver course in the train the trainer course. So they, they were all gathered around the, the table and said, well, we should do this in the Bay Area. We don't have this in the Bay Area. I'm like, okay, sounds good. So we have a course coming up in the Bay Area. It's on uh, May 8th. Uh, it's a Sunday. 
So we have a cadaver course followed by sculpture training and sculpture dinners. Uh, it, again, that's on my, my website and Instagram uh, link. Um, then, uh, you know, I, I have my Coast to Coast cadaver course with uh, Amy uh, in Philadelphia, which, which has been tremendous because she, going back to what we talked about, as opposed to having these you know, turf battles, I'm a surgeon, I'm a plastic surgeon, I'm a nurse, we don't talk to each other, we don't communicate, and, and as, as uh, yeah, Julie was talking about, I'm, I'm exactly the opposite. You know, I'm, I'm one of those all-inclusive kind of people. I, I, I see the value in, in all these people, and I think we should all be friends, we should all educate each other, and we all have something to bring to the table. So, um, I, I started working with Amy, and then she introduced me to a bunch of nurse practitioner PAs and nurses, and we've all become really, really good friends. All the faculty that I have are, as we say, non-core, non-plastic surgeon, which I really don't care, to be honest with you. But, you know, I, I trained them last time when we went there. I said, listen, we meet the day before. I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. They were all brilliant, smart people. They did it better than I did the next day. So. That's what I'm doing. I, I, I basically meet everybody the day before we meet in the cadaver lab, which is better at actually sometimes better than the actual course. So we meet in the cadaver lab. We all sit together, bunch of brilliant brains, and we dissect and talk about it. And we say how we do the course and we do the course the next day. And that's what we're doing in the Bay Area. We're doing the day before we're all I'm meeting with all the game trainers from Galderma, since I have a good relationship with them, uh, doing a couple of cadavers as a practice run. And then on Sunday, we have a bunch of students coming. So if anybody's interested, that's on May uh, 8. And then we decided to do something really big with some of the more advanced uh, cadaver uh, anatomists with Dr. Sykes, um, Dr. Ripkin, Dr. Karimi, uh, Dr. Yolen, and uh, Nikolai. So we, we have a high risk, uh, a cadaver course coming on July 21st. It, again, the date is on my, my website. So this is more for people that have done multiple cadaver courses and just want to go to super, super high risk areas like the, the frown, the forehead, the temple, tear trough, nose, and, and piriform fossa. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of details. Uh, the, the, the faculty that I have, as you know, that you can tell from the names, they're all super anatomists, and I'm sure there's going to be a huge discussion about how to inject the tear trough, what is the safest way, what, how do you get the most uh, 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 result with the most, the littlest amount of fillers, how to do temples, do we go deep, do we go superficial, you know, how do you do noses, do you aspirate, do you not aspirate, why do you aspirate, how do you use ultrasound guided, guided injection. So it's more high risk, high level um, um, training for, for those who've been around for a longer time and have a lot of experience. So I have a lot of things coming up. And the next one is yours, Aesthetic Next, which uh, it's in September. Uh, and I don't know the rest of them after this. I'm, Logan Logan deals with all of those. But there's at, we have at least seven, eight of these courses coming up in the next few months. So I would love to see all of you guys there. If you're interested, please sign up. It would be very exciting. And we'll have a great time and a lot of education. Well, and I'll make sure that we put on on our Instagram and on our podcast sheet um, all the places how you guys can get to the training site on Dr. Sadat's website. Because I think, you know, what you mentioned about working together, collaborating, we're starting to see that more now where, you know, it's multiple physicians together and nurses all talking about things, which before, and you know this, before it was like one person on stage lecturing on about anatomy with a single head showing it and saying, okay, at your table, figure it out, go dissect it, you're on your own. And it doesn't work. I think if I heard nothing at all from what you just said, what I heard most importantly, for those of you who are thinking about building a course of any sort, any kind of course, you have to have curriculum, learning outcomes, a process. You have to have content, a plan. You can't just show up and like, I'm going to teach you how to inject today. It doesn't work that way. It takes so much thought and preparation. Even like Aesthetic Next, you know, a 30-minute lecture, you know this, you build lectures all the time, you and I both do. Even a 30-minute lecture requires hours and hours of building and thinking and getting the slide deck together and are the bullet points the right ones. And take that times eight hours in an anatomy course. I know you put in a lot of time to make that course really, really good because it just, I'd say it's a 10x amount of hours for the time that you lecture is what it takes to prepare. So, you know, that's two full weeks in your case so you can get that, you know, ready to be, to be shown live somewhere. But... 
I want to go to this course in July because what I love most about hearing experts in a room together is all the discourse. Nope, I don't agree. Oh, well, I think it's this. Oh, I think it's that. I think hearing you all respectfully, of course, disagree with each other and justify why you're choosing one over the other gives people an idea that there are so many different ways to skin a cat. And they all, for all of you, are working safely and effectively, but there are different ways to think about it and like learning the new, you know, the new ideas. And to your point about the Turkish um, rhinoplasty, so many of you travel internationally all the time. Like you're going to international conferences and lectures. You're hearing all these cool global ideas that you bring back to the U.S. We've not heard them yet, right, because we're always behind a few years. And then it just sparks this incredible debate about who's right and why and who's not right. And is there even a right or a wrong answer? So I just think if you guys are a more advanced injector, meaning you've done lots of cadaver labs, you have you got to go to that class. I'm going to that class. I'm flying out wherever that is. I will be there because I want to hear it because I feel like that's what we're missing in the industry, too, is that respectful banter as you get more and more advanced, um, especially with adverse events. So I think you mentioned eight, nine classes there. So we will give people all the details. But I want to end before we go on Sculptra because you are, in my opinion, one of the best sculpture injectors in the world. You're a phenomenal sculpture injector. I want to hear your thoughts on that product going forward because we're seeing now a shift to the overfilled face from this dermal filler spot correction to now this platform enhancement, platform rejuvenation. Give us your last few thoughts on Sculptra and how that fits into the overall portfolio. Okay, I got to say one thing because you, you just uh, brought up something that we've been talking about because when we were putting this course together, the advanced one and bring all these high profile anatomists, it's kind of like having a housewife show of, so we're going to call it house anatomist of Beverly Hills. Basically it'll be in Peninsula hotel in Beverly Hills, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of arguments going back and forth and it'll be fun. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't get nasty like those shows, but, but I'm sure that we'll have a lot of disagreement and, but, but that's how we learn. That's how we learn because these are high profile anatomists and they have a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, they're very passionate and, Everyone is super strong, so I, I, I have to figure out how I'm going to keep this <laughs> in a way that it doesn't get out of hand. But it, I'm really excited about that course, as, as you mentioned, and I, I would love for you to be there. It would be a pleasure if you can come. Um, so Sculptra, you, you just hit on my, my favorite, favorite all-time injectable product. Um, it, as you know, those of us who started at the beginning, uh, you know, like Doug Mest and Becky Fitzgerald and me, and, you know, we were just the beginners, you know, in 2004 when it became FDA approved here and Doug Mest started a little bit before that. We are so passionate about this product that 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 it, it's really hard to explain how we feel about it because it's, it's just so much history in this. Um, and as you know, since you've been around with this field, those who have done sculpture since those days, you, you know, once you have a patient that is a sculpture patient, you will never, ever lose that patient because the result is just incredible. And I think sculpture brought us a, a few things. One, because of the work of all these, you know, tremendous geniuses in the world, we really learned the anatomy of volume loss. We did not know volume loss. Fillers didn't really help it. I think sculpture was the one that really made us understand the aging anatomy and volume loss and how to replace the volume loss. So, so because of that, we have learned what happens with the aging process and how the volume loss affects you and how to correct it, not by just going with a filler into a line and fixing the line, but actually treating a region to improve that line that's the symptom of the volume loss. Uh, that that came into picture and that you know that that kind of coincided with understanding the the superficial and the deep fat anatomy fat compartments of the face and what happens to the bone as we get older so again anatomy is key and sculpture was was one of the ones that really made us understand that anatomy and uh you know with sculpture being reborn and and people recognizing how powerful it is in replacing the anatomy very very um, naturally and improving the overlying skin, which most people don't pay attention. You know, uh, Sculptra has, has a secondary side effect or effect, and that is making the skin better. It's called the Sculptra Glow. Um, it, it, hard to explain, hard to picture, hard to video, hard to show, 
But, you know, those of us who've done it know that once you uh, inject the sculpture patient, their skin gets so much better to a point that they come back and say, I don't need to wear as much makeup anymore. My skin is so much better. I glow like an 18 year old. So that sculpture glow is key. And, you know, once people recognize that all of a sudden you have a product that you're improving volume, improving skin texture and, and look uh, in a very, very natural uh, way that it doesn't look overfilled doesn't migrate like fillers. Um, and, uh, you know, believe it or not, because of the viscosity of Sculptra, the side effect is a lot less than, than fillers. So to a point that I think if, if I'm predicting and I'm hoping that I can take it to the next level, Sculptra should be the first thing an injector should learn. Because I think, in my humble opinion, it's safer than fillers, it's safer than neurotoxins. So if you're an injector and you want to really learn the, the, this, this business, sculpture should be the first one you should learn and the first one sh you should master. It's safe, it has a lot of uh, room for, I don't wanna say error, but you have time to kind of establish the volume that you want. And I, I predict that that's what's gonna happen in, in the next uh, uh, year or two, especially with sculpture not having any competitors uh, at this point. So that, that's my prediction with Sculptra. And I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying the ride because we've been waiting for years to get to this level. And I'm hoping that we get to the level where, you know, every aesthetic injector that comes into the field should learn Sculptra first before they learn neurotoxins and fillers. I want you to say that again for people on the back. No, I'm kidding. But yes, I couldn't agree more. I'm over here, guys. You can't see me. I'm shaking my head up and down with like such vigor because... And also, I think because patients who come in who are age appropriate for a true correction should start with sculpture also. Like, I think it's the same for the injector and the patient. You should start with the platform improvement first before you start spot correcting. So I couldn't agree more. Sculpture is, you know, a beautiful product. There are no competitors right now. There's some things, you know, like Renuva, you know, I've discussed Renuva with some fat, you know, sort of like the fat transfer idea, but it's off the shelf. So there's some things that are also sort of regenerative in nature, but I think the sculpture train, I mean, it's left the building and you got to be on it because it's just remarkable as a product and you do body contouring as well you do you know i'm sure you're doing lots of booties and hip dips and all it's just you can use it everywhere it's just a great great product but um so if you want to get sculpture trained i would say you know if you're asking me fly to beverly hills and go see dr sadat but i think you also go to practices too don't you sometimes you go out to different places and obviously you mentioned a few you're going to now but contact him for private training also it's on your site i, I just saw that today as you go on and like request a private training so We'll let Logan deal with that and get that scheduled and <laughs> make that all happen because I know that your schedule is a little busy. But we're at an hour, which is shocking. Um, the hours here go so fast. But as I mentioned, guys, I'll put all this out for you to see, you know, how to get to the site, how to register for classes, also how to just find out more about Dr. Sadat, what he's doing. And for sure, to Static Next, you'll be there. You'll be at LAMCA, so we'll get to see you on some big stages very soon. But for the record, you have been a fantastic guest. Uh, always such a pleasure to talk to you and spend time with you. I, I always love those moments with you. And I'm just excited to see that you are taking off in this giant way with training and with anatomy because goodness knows the industry needs it. So thank you for coming on today. I sincerely appreciate it. And we've loved hearing from you. Thank you so much for having me on. You've done tremendous for the field. And, you know, I have a suggestion for you, actually, because I have a lot of respect for you all these years. You've been doing this and you've been on the forefront of, of, of educating uh, and, you know, I have a lot of respect for educators, as you know, and you've been on the forefront of it. Yes, you're not a doctor, you're not a nurse, but you know what? You, you are one of the key players in the industry. We need, at, for this field, we need a kind of like a mini fellowship. I, I think there's so many people getting into this field that, um, you know, the trainings are not that great. Uh, it's not cohesive. I, I think someone like you should actually head this and create a mini fellowship for someone who wants to become an aesthetic injector, maybe even a doctor, a plastic surgeon, a non-core plastic surgeon, as we say, PA. They should do maybe two, three months of core trainings, cadaver courses, you know, hands-on training, didactics in a lecture hall, but kind of like you do. And we need to have that as, as an industry to train these people and certify people so we protect the general population from from, you know, from a safety standpoint and, and outcome standpoint. So something to think about, I would love to pick your brain on this and, and maybe we can, we can kind of get together at some point and, and design something like that. But this is going to happen. We have to have a, a very good way of training 
uh, individuals, especially newbies coming into the field and making them comfortable so we tr protect them and we protect the general population. And I want to end on that note and thank you for, for being one of the main, main, main key players in the educational uh, platform. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate the, the compliment because we work really hard here to be to be a gateway to education, but I will let you know, you can rest good tonight. That we've been working on that for about a year now, so I, hopefully we can pick your brain as well and get some ideas. I think we've got some things up our sleeve too because the need is, is serious. We don't have a society, we don't have a certification program in aesthetics, and we need something to say a person is ready to go inject, that they're safe, they have effective you know, outcomes, patients are safe, so I couldn't agree with you more. And on that note, I'll say stay tuned for that. And we'll see all of you guys next week for Episode 8. Again, Dr. Sadat, thank you so much. And we will see you in a few weeks at LAMCA. Yeah, Thank you so much. See you guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Record. This podcast is not intended to provide legal or medical advice. It's for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. For more information on this week's guest or to get started with Aesthetic Record, email us at info at aestheticrecord.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more fresh perspectives on disrupting the status quo and surviving in the aesthetics industry.